Thank you, Jackie, and thank you to the Shark Tank committee for inviting me. Um, this is such a great initiative, and I'm really grateful to be here. Let's begin with the video. Most seizures go undiscovered. Today, only a fraction of seizures are reported to the healthcare provider. As a physician, it would be a tremendous advantage to be able to know whether this patient had seizures since I last met him, uh, and how many. Often the patients don't remember themselves. Unique Medical proudly present 24-7 EEG sub-Q, designed to capture EEG signals in daily life for weeks, months, or years. The 24-7 EEG sub-Q comprises an implantable electrode with two channels and a small external device for power supply and data storage. The implant is inserted under local anesthesia in the subcutaneous layer. Once the implant is in place, the system is ready for EEG recordings in less than 15 seconds at any time. The core benefits of our product are threefold. So far, ultra-long-term EEG monitoring has been an unmet clinical need. Only the 24-7 EEG sub-Q provides a solution that captures EEG signals in daily life as long as needed. In addition, we provide an innovative subcutaneous electrode that offers high signal quality with reliable measurements allowing high reproducibility of scientific and clinical data. And finally, the design ensures ease of use and discreteness that gives high compliance by test subjects. Patients would benefit uh, very much from ultra-long-term EG. This would be uh, small portable devices that does not interfere so much with life as an admission to the hospital would. Uh, and it gives you a feeling of being safe uh, in your home environment. EEG sub-Q, the loop recorder of the brain. Okay, <clears throat> so with our 24-7 EEG sub-Q, we've recorded on 22 subjects who wore the system for at least one month. We now have what corresponds to more than 590 days of continuous EEG, and we've seen no safety issues. This led us to start an epilepsy trial where we implanted the subcutaneous electrode in temporal lobe epilepsy patients. This was done during a 15-minute procedure under local anesthesia. Um, uh, the, uh, the patients were then admitted to the EMU for five days, followed by three months of home recording with our device alone. The primary objectives of the study is to uh, investigate the feasibility of a two-channel monitor, to investigate the e-graphic seizure expression in the EMU compared to subcutaneous registrations, and finally to compare the number of seizures recorded with our device as compared to the number acknowledged by the patients themselves. So far we've completed one subject and uh, we are monitoring on another three subjects as I'm speaking right now. We expect to include another 20 subjects within one year. I would now like to show you the very first seizure we recorded with our 24-7 EG sub -Q. So it was recorded in the EMU, so it was verified by video EG. So we have two channels over the temporal lobe, the anterior seen uh, up top and, and posterior seen below. In the beginning, we see some no noise in the EEG, but also some nice background activity. Then at seven seconds, the seizure begins, signified by a rhythmical low-frequent activity in the posterior channel. This continued for one minute until the seizure stopped. We then compared the, uh, the scalp EEG with the subcutaneous EEG, and the expressions were identical. We now got more than 20 seizures recorded in the EMU, and they've all been identifiable in the subcutaneous EG as well. 
So we believe we got a system that opens up for undreamt application within epilepsy research, such as patient empowerment, suited prevention, diagnostics, AD dosage optimization, and seizure risk assessment. And you probably got a lot of other ideas and applications that could be really interesting, which we would also love to hear about. So to sum up, our system provides a uh, help for the patient for better treatment, personal safety, and less hassle, all leading to the overall goal of quality of life improvement. Thank you. So I got an, uh, an implant here, the subcutaneous implant, and then I'm wearing the external device as well, which you can see. So this goes, it clicks onto there, that one's in your head, and this is external, and you wear that. Oh, okay. Yeah. You open for questions? Is that the yes, please. <laughs> so where, where, is the, where is the electrode recording from? Just from the single side, or is it two sides, either end of the antenna or what? I, you had two channels displayed up there. Is that from two devices or is this No, so this single uh, device is recording on two channels. There are three electrodes, it's hard to see from here, uh, but there are three electrodes on them which give you the two channels. Yeah, I can see them. Can um, we would really love to be able to have oh. a dual implant uh, because where you could um, record on, on both side of the head. Unfortunately, that's not part of the, uh, the de development plan this far. But, uh, but I really hope you will support me to, to, <laughs> to give the fund to such an um, development. Have you recorded any seizures from the contralateral side? Sorry? Have you recorded any seizures that were confined to the contralateral side as soon as you implanted on the left, for instance, and seizures coming from the right? Yeah. Uh, no, the patients we've recorded on were all known for the focus, so we implanted on the side of, of the focus, so we knew. Where it was, uh, that was also my question, how you decide on the location of the electrode and, and what range of locations have you been testing? Right, so no, uh, in the beginning this is a feasibility study where we know our patients pretty well and uh, therefore we can place the electrode very well as well. Uh, but they are all missile serpent lobe epilepsy patients and, um, and, and by the three electrodes we got, we do cover the temporal lobe Pretty all right. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so far that's uh, how we're doing it. And how do you foresee the analysis, interpretation of the data? Uh, our primary goal so far has to been to to uh, collect a lot of data, and uh, then we are looking into doing some seizure detection as well, looking into uh, to algorithms there. Um, what I've seen visually, it should be fairly easy or possible to do, uh, to do an automatic detection of these seizures. I'm just trying to visualize how the external part Can you speak gets to the attached. Is that, speak the oh, I'm trying to visualize how the external part gets attached to the person. It gets attached to clothing by a, like a magnet, like under and then over. Is that, is that how it... So in young infants that wouldn't be good because they'd be pulling it off, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So in the beginning, we are getting it approved for adults, okay. simply because that's <laughs> easier for, uh, due to regulatory uh, reasons and ethical reasons. Um, when we come to, to infants or, or uh, toddlers, uh, we do see some issues. Also, uh, mentally retarded will also probably uh, get it off. So we will probably need to make some headband where we could keep it in. We haven't looked into that yet, but that would probably be good to you. Is it waterproof? I mean, can you wear it in the shower, or is it something that you just wear when you're up and about? It's waterproof uh, for raining weather, but not to the shower. You will need to take it off while showering. Normally, subcutaneous electrodes tend to have less artifact in some ways because we tend to use them in ICU and un unconscious patients. 
But uh, regardless of that, it looked like you had a fair amount of high frequency artifact on the EEG. Yeah, so, so we have made uh, direct comparisons between scalp EEG and sorry, uh, subcutaneous EEG, and we see less artifacts. Uh, but the, uh, the, the figures show there, the, uh, the patient was talking just before having the seizure, and we do see artifacts while, while talking, um, which you also do in the EMU. So that's uh, difficult to come about, um, but yeah. How, lo how, how long can they keep one uh, recording going? So how this device, this device stores data for 30 days, and then you need to download it before you can continue the, the recording. Is there any problem with skin erosion from the attachment? No, no, we haven't seen any. So the longest we've had uh, uh, patients walking around with this system was for three months, where they use a, a patch to keep the, the disc onto the skin, and we saw no disc erosion, no uh, skin erosion. Sorry. So what did the patients do when they had to shower? Did they take it off and put it back on? And how did they know how to place it back on again? Were, was there a dot? How did they know about the placement? Uh, so, so yeah, they did have to take it off while showering. And um, we have a, a special communication system where they can, um, I'm just borrowing this one. <laughs> there is actually an LED behind this button. Um, and within the magnet, which will only light up when you have a, a good connection to the implantable part. And, and thus they know where to place it and then they put it on. It, it looks like you might have to have somebody help you because the wire is pretty short. So being able to look at it and place it. So how did you face those challenges? This is a demo version. So the wire is actually twice as long on the final product. But yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. And then did the wire have to be taped to there? You know, because it's not just pulling it off, but it could easily get caught and be dislodged. Yeah. So far, we haven't had any problems there. We have a wire clip where you can sort of make the right uh, size for you. Um, it does get pulled off if you take off your shirt and so on, but then you need to put it on again. Then this one will tell you that there's no connection and, and you will put it on. But so far we haven't seen that many disconnections during an entire day. Normally when you put it on, you can leave it there until next showering or what are your plans for the funds if you were to receive them? Yeah, so one thing is I would really love to, uh, to develop this one for a, a dual implant. Uh, right now it's only for one side, but there's a lot of really interesting applications where you need to, uh, to collect data from both sides of the head simultaneously. Another thing uh, I think would be really great is to have an, um, a Bluetooth transmitter. So you do not have to put it into the PC to download data. Um, with the Bluetooth uh, transmitter, you would also be able to do some online processing with a, a smartphone, for example. And, uh, and finally, I think we are, we are getting a CE mark in Europe. And we would really love to take it to the States as well. But that will cost us a significant amount of money. So. Uh, if you show there's a big interest here, then it will definitely help us to go over here. So. Oh, he's bribing us with coming to the States. <laughs> Two very quick questions from the audience. Just I don't to clarify, have any $25,000 in my pocket, so what I can still... Pardon? Can I still ask a question without $25,000? Yes. Without? The $25,000. You, you have a collective $75,000. So um, quick. So quick one. So the use case that you described, the patient that, um, you know, they don't, re they don't recall their seizures. Did you do any market research about acceptability? Did you really ask patients how acceptable this would be? And, and how would those patients be identified by the physician? So what would people, what kind of people would you really consider uh, this device before? And then I have one technical comment. In the traces you saw, usually an ictal pattern starts fast and then increases in amplitude and then decreases and gets slower again. Mm. I didn't really see it. And why didn't it spread to the other elect electrode, which is it's so Conrad, cool. this is not quick. Just <laughs> <laughs> an EG question, come on. <laughs> so uh, your first question was um, uh, 
how we, we saw the, uh, the market and um, the use case. Well, we know and we've heard at this meeting a few times that our patients are really bad at um, giving us good, reliable data on how many seizures they're actually having. Uh, some say 30% are uh, they actually acknowledge and, and, and maybe less or, or more depending on the, uh, on the use case. So yeah, we are looking into exactly where it's, uh, it's, um, the best use cases are. What we're doing right now is we are trying to uh, make good collaborations with uh, researchers who believe that their patients are really uh, uh, would have a great benefit of our system. So right now this is just for patients who are known to have temporal lobe epilepsy. You said, did you say temporal lobe only at this point? Yeah, okay. Probable ELA, ELA or, or definite missile temporal lobe epilepsy is what we are focusing on now. But the, uh, the implant can go wherever on the, uh, the head you would like to actually. So if you have a, uh, an application where it's different, that would be possible too. But you're starting with temporal lobe and later you may do extra temporal or generalized or something like that. We start with temporal lobe because yeah. it's a really neat case. Uh, they are quite well that's defined and, and there's a lot of them who have refractory epilepsy. Sure. So, uh, so that's where we're beginning with the uh, feasibility study. And just technically, finally, about the electrodes, you have three recording electrodes to have two bipolar channels. Exactly. And so we have, you have the a reference in the middle of the, of the three electrodes. Well, I mean, they're bipolar. You're recording from electrode one to two, that's channel one, and then one. two to three would be channel two. Exactly. And you have a, you have a ground electrode, obviously, as well. The or? ground is actually, is actually situated, in the, situated in, the, um, in the housing here. Okay. So it's uh, a different place. Thank you. So did you say you, you have the CE mark, or you're going to go for the CE mark? We expect to get the CE mark at the end of the year. We are in the process of approval right now. So under normal circumstance, once you have the C mark, you'd, it'd be relatively easy to commercialize it. So the question is, how much good does 50,000 or in this 100,000, in the range we're talking about, how much difference would that make if you're that far along? You're right. So we are going to get this C mark no matter what. The, the, the question is, um, how much, uh, how, how well I'll be able to go to my board of directors to tell them to further invest in the, in the device. And uh, 50,000 and, and simply the Epilepsy Foundation bagging this will make a huge difference. And what do you anticipate to be the cost of the final product? Have you thought that through? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, of course it depends on the volume that the investigator will buy. But uh, for, for this entire system, um, normally you would probably be able to use the the external device multiple times depending on the application again. But for one system, we are talking in the range of five to ten thousand dollars. And it's what happens if the patient loses the device, the external device? I mean, I know it's on a magnet, but um, you know, it could get dislodged <laughs> and at five or ten thousand dollars, and I'm sure that's your cost of goods. That's not what it would actually be sold for, right? Uh, yeah. Or is that your cost? What's is the five thousand, ten thousand your cost of goods, or is that what you would mark it up to? I just want to understand. That's what we would mark it up, up to. to. Yeah, yeah, and of course, a lot of the prices of the uh, of the implant, which you can't really lose, um, if you lose the external part. First of all, as it is today, you will lose the data that has been recorded there and you will need a new one. Uh, so yeah, that's a, uh, a risk. Yeah, so it could get dislodged, dressing and fall into some water um, and be destroyed. That's because there's no protection against getting wet. Okay. That's true, that's true. I'd say in the, in the 590 days of continuous recording, we actually haven't seen that yet, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, well, you must have had very good patience. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to move on, but thank you very much. <laughs>